Wisconsin is, means a lot to us. Absolutely. Um, this is our second right holiday sub shop. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are um, we are a networking, mentorship, and discussion nonprofit that focuses on creatives in the Ethiopian and Eritrean community. And uh, it just started off as a one-off event at the Soho Warehouse in August of last year. Um, yeah. Just a general That's conversation right. about sustaining and protecting right. the culture now that the culture is becoming a lot more mainstream. We have the weekend out there singing in heart. We have everybody repping the air tree flag because of Nipsey and, you know, references in media now. And now that it's becoming a lot more mainstream, it's about how do we protect it and how do we tell our own stories and narratives from our own perspectives. Um, so it started off as a one-off conversation, but, you know, we were hearing from you guys that it needs to keep going, you know? So we turned it into a rolling series, and here we are now. We're covering film and TV, um, and it's going to continue. You know, we might do fashion, music, culinary arts, whatever it may be, but we're here to highlight you guys and all your great creativity. So. Well, you guys are, you guys are, we're basically like curating you guys uh, so that you guys can continue to con uh, connect and build horizontal um, networks alongside uh, the vertical power structures especially uh, because we are black in America. We have to remember that everything that we contribute in the United States is going to be attached to that. And um, you know, we come from a, a culture that has not been, uh, it, I mean, it's contested, but it hasn't been culturally uh, colonized. And so uh, we have to understand the power of indigenous black culture and keeping our, keeping our authority on the voice. So I just wanted to add that. Awesome. So for this event, it's called Carrying the Torch. It's a film and TV panel and discussion. We partnered with the Habesha Film Association. So we're going to have Dr. Noe come up and tell us a bit about who they are. Yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming up today. Thank you, thank you, and all the panelists, and now uh, for organizing this event. Uh, my name is Dr. Noe. I came here seven years ago for grad school, for film school, and when I was in grad school, I didn't really have any community like this where I could go and work with other other chefs. There was three of us in the program, and uh, so when we graduated, we all met at a film festival, and we said, hey, we didn't really know each other for three years, but we all lived here, so let's create like something that can connect everybody, like here, in Europe, back home, and then we decided to make this nonprofit that should encompass the whole Horn of Africa, not just Ethiopia, even though we have a lot of Ethiopians and Eritreans for that come here first. Um, so that's kind of how we started. We started three years ago and we started building, having workshops and actors' workshops and directing workshops, and we want to just keep building and really introducing people so you guys can take it and make your own projects after this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I feel like we're back to you too, right? Um, that is generous, generously hosting us. So if you could give a round of applause for the Black Inner Center. Really awesome. Okay, so we're going to get the panel started. I want to quickly introduce everyone. We have Salome Halu, a reporter at Variety. We have Leah Takala, Associate Creative Director at Parkwood Entertainment, Beyonce's production company, if you guys don't know. <laughs> and then we have Prince... Joelle McCoyman, who is the co-founder of Old World, New World, a production company based in LA. And we also have an additional panelist, um, Binyam Bizuna, a uh, staff writer for Jimmy Kimmel, Dave, and many other shows. But uh, his flight from New York got delayed. So um, we're going to zoom him in at a certain point while he's in his Uber on his way here. But he will be here, so you guys can ask him any questions and still talk with him um, towards the end of it. And then just real quick before we begin, I want to encourage the audience to please don't be shy, come up, please uh, participate in the discussion. We have a microphone here for you guys, literally. This is like a clubhouse format, so if you guys feel so compelled or you want to add more to the discussion, please come up and speak. That is a big part of what we're doing here today. And a uh, special shout out to Dr. Mahedis Mandefro, who we're going to zoom in towards the end as well. Um, she's done a lot of incredible things. Um, she'll go into detail about that. Um, she's on the grounds in Ethiopia working in the film industry there. Um, and is, yeah, I can go down the list of her resume, but it's pretty extensive. So, um, yeah, we're going to zoom her in also later. So, we have an incredibly diverse panel. Um, so, please give them a warm welcome. And So we're going to kick it off. Um, we're going to start 
with breaking into the industry, you know? Uh, something that we all kind of, it's kind of like a mystified concept, you know, when it comes to entertainment. How do you get into it? It's just like, I want to be in it, but how did you get there? So can you all introduce yourselves, your current roles, and how did you get to, to where you are now? Just like a quick version. Uh, hi, I'm, like you said, I'm Salome Hailu. I'm a reporter at Variety. I cover the TV industry there. Um, as far as breaking in, I feel like that's still happening. I'm like, I've only been in LA a year and a half, and like a year into having a full-time job, so like check in with me in a couple years. But uh, as far as how I got here, um, so I'm from Austin, Texas, where I grew up. I was in school um, studying English. I knew I wanted to be a writer in some capacity, didn't know how, kind of found my way into student journalism while I was in school. Um, and then kind of randomly, a girl that I like kind of knew in high school, but like didn't really was, she was at a really good journalism school that like placed there and students had really good internships. Um, and so she was interning at Variety, like she, she was a year above me. Um, I reached out to her after a reading story that she re posted. I was like not trying to anger her for anything. I'm really uncomfortable with networking, but I just read her work and was like, oh, this is really cool. And she was like, oh, do you want my boss? And I was like, no. <laughs> um, but then eventually went through with it. So after I graduated college, I moved out here, did an internship with them for six months, and then stuck around on the TV team. Um, hello, my name is Leah, and I'm a associate creative director at Parkwood Entertainment. Um, how I got started, um, I was in New York for grad school studying design and technology, um, and it was the same year that uh, Beyonce had the Formation Scholars um, Scholarship. So I applied for the scholarship, I was running around at my school, um, they interviewed me for an internship, and I got the internship. Um, after graduating, I freelanced for a little bit before they offered me um, a staff position, and I've been there ever since. So it's been about four, four years, five years. Um, that's my quick story. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Yoel McConnell, and I'm a co-founder and CEO of Old World New World Productions. Um, and I agree with you, Salome. I also don't think you, you know, that a break in as as much as a quietly entering <laughs> the Hollywood space. But uh, we, I, I started the company with my wife, Ariana, and we moved from DC uh, to LA back in January 2020. And uh, basically our mission is to tell powerful Ethiopian and black diaspora stories uh, that inspire global audiences. So stories that are universal, but very culturally specific. Uh, and so we've been doing this for the past few years, and um, you know, every day, at it, hopefully we'll um, be announcing some things soon, but obviously as we all know in this industry, everything takes a lot of time. Uh, so yeah, but anyway, glad to be here. Thank you. Well, we're excited to see what the dates that you announce coming soon, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell us, what's uh, the favorite part about what you guys do? Um, that is a hard question. Um, I think my favorite part about what I do is also why I'm like, feel weird about being here because my job is about like asking questions and listening and not about answering questions or people looking at me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've gotten to meet a lot of really wonderful people doing what I do, both like at my at my place of work. I mean, I've learned a lot from, from a lot of really wonderful people, but I think that um, I grew up kind of in a lot of art spaces, didn't know exactly like where I was going to end up. I was like, performed, I was like, I did theater, I did dance, I did music, I did art, and I never like knew, like I never felt drawn to being a performer or being an artist in that way, but like knew I wanted to be adjacent in some way. Um, and what I realized as I grew older that like what I loved about being in those spaces was like the rehearsal process, the ideation process, like having questions, coming together, talking to people, like deciding what my interpretation of a text was and like putting those choices together. Um, and so journalism for me kind of became a way to just get to be adjacent and um, be a parasite and um, latch on to all these artists that I think are cool and when I have questions I get to ask them instead of um, just continuing to wonder. Yeah. Um, for me I think the most interesting thing about being in a creative space professionally is that it's kind of a never-ending cycle of learning something new. Um, I think there are a lot of stories that haven't been told, as I'm sure all of you know, 
Um, and with that means more collaborations, more people who may not have had the study or the background of, let's say, filmmaking or creating. And I think having that raw, never done this before, I'm just gonna figure it out as I go uh, mentality and meeting more people like that, you continue to learn different ways of telling stories, of capturing narratives, of capturing faces and portraits. Um, and I think we're in a space now with just the accessibility that uh, the film industry and the music industry, because now everyone has access to it in a different way than before. I think you're constantly going to be inspired to kind of find new intentions for every single story you're telling um, and the perspective as well. So I think that's probably the most interesting thing for me. Yeah, I think for me the most interesting part of the work is definitely obviously the creative part. Uh, storytelling it's such a powerful tool in 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 um in you know in human life and human history and i think i get a lot of pleasure out of um sharing my culture in a powerful way to reshape the narrative for ethiopia for africa in general in the world um and i just really enjoy when i get to talk to somebody and they're so excited because they didn't know about a story uh that you know some of us growing up in this culture we know very well but uh the ethiopian culture especially has not been as widely shared as as, as uh, others and so i get a lot of pleasure it makes me feel proud to put out a, a, a narrative out there that people can get to relate to our people more and also just learn of how a rich history we have Incredible. Okay, so really quick, um, kind of like popcorn. Uh, what's a project you've worked on that you're most proud of? Just real quick. <laughs> In any order. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know what I'm most proud of, but like the most like recent big project I did was I um, in November I was went to a cabin in the middle of the woods in upstate New York to um, talk to Steve from Blue's Clues, who I like grew up on. Oh <laughs> um, Actually super epic. Yeah, he like lives in the middle of nowhere. Um, I went to his house, he like made me chilly and we talked for two and a half hours about like children's media and what he's been doing for the last 20 years. And that was really cool. <laughs> yeah, really touched yeah. We talked all about that and how he got to that point and everything. That was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we know you got a lot. Beyonce, <laughs> come on now. I don't know if I necessarily have a favorite, but um, I can say that I'll just, between Homecoming and Black is King, I think what I liked about both are kind of like in contrast to one another. So for Homecoming, being first generation, growing up in the US, um, understanding a lot of the black American culture uh, that was, kind of displayed in that film and feeling connected to that was an amazing feeling. And then on the other hand, with Black is King, I felt like I was able to contribute more perspective as an Ethiopian American. Um, not that it was mainly, you know, Afrobeats is kind of more on the West African uh, side of influence, um, but still in ways I was able to kind of suggest cast or um, some wardrobe, some styling, things that we can kind of just be proud of, even though it's not the majority of the cultures represented. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't have a favorite. I, I don't think I'll ever have a favorite project. I do a lot of freelance work on the side too, so it's hard to compare personal projects to work projects to client projects, so yeah. Black is King was epic. <laughs> so that's my favorite for, for you. Um, I, I'll split it into two. I'll say one project that I've uh, accomplished and, and completed and uh, another one that you have yet to uh, do. But one I'm especially proud of is the um, children's book that I wrote, um, a two, two, as a two-book series actually, called Last Gate of the Emperor, which is a Afrofuturistic sci-fi adventure centered around Ethiopia with an Ethiopian young boy character who's the hero of our story. Um, very deeply inspired by my own life, kind of uh, discovering my roots. Uh, so I kind of imbued that into his character. He discovers that he's connected to this um, um, uh, royal family uh, that ruled you know, the, the galaxy. So very proud of that, and I'm very happy that children are enjoying it because really that's the future, right? The, the next generation, if they can grow up with these stories, it will just be second nature to them. Whereas in, you know, when I grew up, there weren't stories like that. So I'm very proud of that one. I just want to uh, tag on real quick, uh, just a little comment on uh, uh, what Leah mentioned to Black is King and, and about um, 
you know, even taking up, basically taking up space as an, as an East African person. And um, even though that, uh, you know, obviously we all know that Beyonce is very large. She's a very large player in the Western canon. And as Afrobeats and uh, more African, um, you know, a creative influence gets to be on, on the main stage, the fact that you are still taking up space and making sure there are little, those little nuances that are coming from us helps to actually counter the idea that Africa is a country, right? Because there's still a lot of uh, media currently that, that's going around that um, uh, it, it's easy for people who are on the outside to assume a lot of things. The, a lot of those nuances are missed, so I just wanted to tag uh, that on there. And then you said you... Yeah, um, the other project that you yet to do, no worries, no worries. Um, <laughs> is a TV series uh, centered around uh, the life and coming to power of Emperor Haile Selassie, who's my great-grandfather. Uh, so you can imagine a The Crown meets Game of Thrones. <laughs> and that's a project that we're actively working on now, and uh, it's going to be called King of Kings. Very, very proud of that one, too. I, I'm sorry, I have, to have a, I have a comment on that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So that, that's going to be a lot of like groundbreaking. As we know, like a lot of uh, television has developed into like the historical, historical drama, but also just TV, almost like movies at this point. And I'm, I'm very proud of that for you, just because of the fact that, one, like we really need to tell, that, that story needs to be told for a lot of different reasons, right? Like collective healing, right? There's collective uh, just history that, you know, I'm gonna say this real short. I went to an event. There was a, a, a book vendor there. That, per, that book vendor happened to be a Habesha book vendor. I was so floored because there, I've never seen like Habesha history books written in English that are available in the US. Like I have to like hit my mom to find a book and get it translated and maybe go over to Ethiopia and, and grab, you know what I mean? Like it's like a whole process. So just the fact that more of the history is coming out and people can actually like collectively experience it and digest it, process it, and then like build off of that. It's very, very important, so. Yeah. And it's incredible. We're seeing a lot more of this as well, you know, with Azay Tesfai, with uh, Sheba, you know, who is producing a, a, a show, I guess, um, about the Queen of Sheba, and it's being told from an Ethiopian's perspective as well. She's co-producing it, so that's incredible. Like, everything we're talking about today, we're actually seeing it happen in real life at the same time, so literally in real time. Um, so, uh, for Joel or Yoel, um, so as someone who comes from a non-traditional background, um, being a corporate attorney, going into film, um, why did you choose to get into film, and why did you use media specifically to look deeper into Ethiopia? Sure. So, I think I've always, even through school and law school, always been a very creative. I always had my eyes on entertainment, but. As you know, life happens, and I kind of went into the corporate uh, lawyer uh, career that I'm in now. Um, but I always had this deep sense that I wanted to tell the story, like carrying the torch, right? I definitely feel uh, just as an Ethiopian, and then on top of that, being a member of the Ethiopian royal family, uh, a, a deep responsibility to, to tell these stories. And I think um, the, the the real spark came. Um, so my wife and I used to talk about making a film, a documentary all the time, and then we got married, and as some of you may have seen, we got a lot of uh, press, and, and it was very uh, kind of um, everywhere. And at that time, we started getting people reaching out to us. And so that's when we decided, okay, this good momentum, let's start coming to LA. We started taking trips from DC, and then I tapped into my network, obviously, of, uh, from law school. Howard is very deep in, in, in the industry, so that's, that's, I've been very grateful for all the connections I've made through uh, my, my law school friends. Um, and decided, OK, the moment is right. And then, of course, since we moved here, obviously, black content has gotten even hotter Obviously, after all this, the happenings in 2020, where now there's actually an interest. And I think that there's also an interest because it's commercially viable and successful. So the timing felt really right, and that's why now uh, I still practice law. So I, this is an what we do here is in addition to that, uh, but definitely looking to transition fully into the storytelling because, as I said, I feel like we have such a rich history that people don't really know about, and I realize that you know you can't wait on others to tell your story. You have to you know get get in the game and, and do it yourself. So that's why now the timing felt right to to make this this pivot. 
so we're going to transition to hobby versus career because you know a lot of people do want to get into film and TV, but it's how do you make that transition from it being a hobby to making it a professional thing that you get paid from. <laughs> so uh, Salome, tell us. So how do you balance your passion for film with the tenacity that's required to take it to a professional level? I think I'm in kind of a yeah, kind of a strange position in that like as a journalist, it's like it's doing what I do is something that's kind of hard to be able to pursue on like a at least like a personally fulfilling level as a hobby because like so much of like because <laughs> um, like getting to do like, to ask people questions that like all the burning questions that I have like the hobby part of it for me is like when I'm home on my couch watching TV and movies um, and like having the questions and it's like well damn I either don't get the question answered or I turn it into work <laughs> and look up their publicist and set up a call. Um, so <laughs> um, I, f I guess that, yeah, I don't know about, is there a balance? I don't know if I have a good answer for that personally, um, but I think I've come to a really wonderful place where like, I think that I am able to kind of couch some things and, and keep them personal um, and not turn everything into work. Um, but yeah, I think the love is just in the engagement, in, in watching TV, watching film, um, having conversations with others about it. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit different and whereas I feel like you can, you can like, m like write a film on your own and keep it for yourself if you want to in a way that I'm jealous of. <laughs> Yo, what's good? Okay, so <laughs> uh, welcome. This is Binyam Bazuna. <laughs> uh. yes. So he's a comedian, staff writer for Jimmy Kimmel Live, Dave Season 2, Resident, Resident Alien, um, and many other great works. Um, like we said, he had a flight, so he was a bit late, but he made it. And then I, you know, the lift brought me quicker <laughs> than I thought, so I'm here. That could be like a whole show episode. <laughs> I mean, it felt like it. I was like looking at the clock, my phone was dying. We made it, we made it. You made it, you made yeah. it. Thank you for making it. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, so for Leah, um, have you been in a position where you had to choose the integrity of a concept um, while dealing with the realistic, the realities of production? So you know, you maybe have this great idea, but you have budget and logistics and as a creative director, you have to be mindful of all that, especially working on big projects. And I know you said you're freelance, so you know there's a range probably, but how does that look for you? It's tough. It's very tough. Um, it ranges, it depends on the project, I think. Um, when it comes to client work and freelance work, sometimes it's not as important to me to kind of have invested some emotions or feelings towards an, an idea or a project. Um, but when you have invested a lot of your own, uh, I guess, perspective or creativity or interest and you get attached, which is like the first rule you shouldn't do, you should never get attached to any idea, um, especially if it's not something you're producing or creating on your own. It's just tricky. <laughs> um, you know, there's ways of changing it. Maybe there is different iterations. You can kind of take a different approach to the concept. I think the most important step is identifying the intention and once you have that intention locked, if, a, if the budget is an issue or if time is an issue, there's ways of creating variations of that initial intention and still having a beautiful outcome of that project. Um, if you are just creating based on aesthetic, then you're gonna hit a few more bumps in the road if like a budget is an issue and you may not be able to get that aesthetic that you were, you were hoping for. And that's why I try to always lead with intention. That way the, the medium or the outcome can be anything as long as it ties back to your initial goal. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay, so we're gonna switch topics now. So we're gonna go to Habesha versus Habesha American and that distinction. So um, there's obviously similarities, right? We all look the same, we all eat the food, same foods and all that. But at the end of the day, we come from very different perspectives. Like, you know, I, I can say I'm Habesha, but I can't necessarily relate with the experience of people back home. Like, I have a very unique perspective that a lot of us can relate to as being part of the diaspora. And so that translates when it comes into the work that we do and the narratives that we tell, because we can't exactly tell the stories of people back home, nor should we try to. You know, we have a very unique um, uh, way of living and stories to tell. So question it would be, does it make sense for us to have our own lexicon of film as diaspora? Um, or 
you know, I, I think I kind of answered it for us, but <laughs> why, what, what is it, how is it important for you, for our, what am I asking? The story that we're telling right now as Habesha Americans as we continue to walk into the future and, you know, really create what it means to be Habesha American, especially as first gen, since we, a lot of us, like, a lot of people who came today, the first thing they said was, hey, this didn't exist when I first got here, you know? So we're doing that, we're bridging those gaps, we're, we're and so, anyway. I do think though, however, you know, being Abisha American, it's obviously important to tell stories from your perspective and be as authentic as you can. But let's say I wanted to create something based on my mother's story or my father's story. I think there are ways to go about that and still be authentic and true to the culture. You just need to do your research and properly uh, account for events or, I don't know, I, I think, America, I mean, people in American film do that all the time, right? They tell stories of a time period that they're not in, so it's not necessarily authentic, and the culture has shifted, regardless of where you're from and who you, how you identify. Um, but people, there are, there are right ways of doing it, and there are wrong ways of doing it. So I think, obviously, it's best to just always be as authentic and respectful, right? w whether or not it's your story or someone else's story, but I think we still have the responsibility to highlight stories of people back home, given the platform and the opportunity and the privilege we have, but we just need to be careful that we're not telling the story for them versus helping them tell their story. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay, is this open I don't know, know if y'all felt that, but I felt that last point. <coughs> <laughs> um, I was just at a Sundance and they had this like African filmmakers panel and uh, one of the dudes on it was his former ambassador to South Africa and he was talking about how when he would have these meetings not even about just like people investing in film but any type of investment in Africa like uh, you should invest in business here you should you know build a theater here whatever so many of the people he'd be talking to would be like but Africa it's don't you have like blood diamonds and child soldiers or whatever like and they're just repeating what they've seen from you know the media that's often made by the, the west it's not made by the people who actually live there and he was talking about how if you empower the people who live there or you know it's like coming together with you know us from the resources we have and connects we have to work with people over there you can make these things that are just about like what's the insecure of Ethiopia, you know? Like what's what's the stuff that's just about people living that isn't about like this is the hardest fucking starvation bullshit, you know? And that's what I'm excited to see is just stories of everyday life. And you know, West Africa has it going on with Nollywood and whatever. It's like where's our Habesha wood, you know? Let's get that going. So what does that look like? What does bridging the gap between folks here and folks back home look like? Do we have writers go back there or talent from there come here and? I mean, like, I have a lot of ideas on how to accomplish that, but I mean, I think it's, yeah, it's going back and spending time there and getting to, you know, how can you not create like you're someone from the West? It, it, I think you gotta humble yourself and be like, I don't know everything, you know? This may sound like I'm contradicting what I said earlier, but I think <laughs> um, even if we do start with ourselves or do start with like the first generation um, experience, that still involves our parents or our relatives who were born there. We have cousins who were born there. I think it's still relevant and it still kind of, it still does the job of representing even mm -hmm. if we're not going back because a lot of people don't have the privilege of going back. Yeah. Um, and spending a long, you know, a lot of time there to do that research, I think you can start at your home. Um, it's it's like um, Rami or yeah. Mo, like mm -hmm. they're telling these stories either as immigrants, young immigrants, or first generation, um, and it's funny, and you still get a sense of who their parents are, where their parents came from, but from a perspective that we all can relate to, even if it's not from the same country. And I think we have these examples. Um, and it doesn't have to be a comedy, but I'm just saying, you can start at home, you can start with your own story and how you relate to your parents or how you relate to people at your church. Um, and yeah. you'll, make it, you'll make it to this authentic place, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
Um, I feel like there's also, um, I'm really excited to talk to Dr. Mohedez about what, what she's doing in Ethiopia because like, as somebody who, like I grew up in Texas, I'm not fluent in Amarinya. Um, I mean, I've like only been able to engage with like a pretty small amount of like Abasha media, like really Abasha media, because so much of like what's there, it's like is pro produced on a small scale that like isn't a isn't for exporting to America, um, but also like I feel like so much of like figuring out what an Abasha film lexicon, an Abasha American film lexicon is like would have to be about engaging with, with what's already there. And it's like we have so many people who are bilingual. It's like let's take what's there, let's like let's get subtitles, let's do translations and figure out what the culture is there. Um, because it's not like, you know, we aren't because we like came to America and learned English and things that we're not the only ones who like know how to write um, and like can crack a joke, you know? Um, so I think that, um, yeah, there's so much to do with like, I don't know, it just makes me think about like, you know, when like like white people move to like a gentrifying neighborhood and they're like, we have to do something for the poor people. Like I, <laughs> like I think there's, we have a lot of like power and ability and possibility um, in like the position that we're all in working in this industry. Um, but also I feel like we shouldn't treat anything like we're working from scratch when we haven't like found a way to to engage with what already exists. So um, the question, well, we had a question of, was there an interest between uh, us going back to Ethiopia and creating that? So it sounds like that there's a general consensus of this, right? That there is a need for this and a need. I think there's an interest. There's I an don't interest. know. I don't know about need. I think you kind of touched on that. Um, again, if if the point is storytelling, there's plenty of people doing it already, and there's plenty of ways to continue doing it. But I don't know if it's a need right now. I don't know if it's <coughs> not happening already. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting how like uh, people from so many different cultures will tell their stories without the worry that it's too niche or small. Um, you know, like how many movies are there about like World War II or the Holocaust or about whatever, you know, I know that's just a specific thing, but it's like, I, I think I've thought in the past that, oh, stories is about this or is for too small of an audience or who, how many people are there f that there's this, like this is for, but I think the truth is if it's a like engaging story about humans, like, people that aren't Habesha will also enjoy it too. And so I think like we shouldn't like hold ourselves, uh, you know, back by thinking this, uh, we, we don't have enough of us or something, you know? Yeah, that's just another thing. And also agreeing with what you said about making things that are about ourselves and using examples like Rami or Mo, like I made a pilot this past year for Hulu that's exactly that. It's like me and my friend who like, my character is Abisha American, his character is Nigerian American, and we got to shoot that, and Rami was one of our producers, and it was it was literally what you're saying, like it was, but we didn't lead with their African, like that's their whole identity, it was just like, they happened to be, you know, and that, that works its way into the story, but um, yeah, I, th I think in the same way like anyone could happen to be Jewish, or they happen to be Muslim, like, I think it was rela it was relatable to everyone who's first generation. Yeah, I mean, there's a great example of that out right now. Um, so there's a director named Aiden Ababa in Toronto, and she created Virgin the series, and it's a show about these 20-something-year-old East African girls who are friends, and they're just navigating life as 20-something-year-olds dealing with relationships and just life in general, and you know how chaotic that and crazy that can be. And it got picked up by a streaming service in Canada. And so, you know, there's people out here telling these stories. That's not, the focal point is not, oh, we're just have a shot or anything yeah. like that. But, you know, it's part of our identity. Of course, it's gonna just, you're, it's gonna be apparent in the content, but it doesn't have to be so forthright. Yeah. It's like few and far between. I guess, well, and it's also like about distribution, like Maharit was talking about, like if you don't, have the platform for people to really see it, then you, it basically doesn't exist, right? But um, there's this dude, what's the name of that? Uh, he's like a director who 
uh, he's like old school Ethiopian director who uh, Kailani. Kailani. Karima, yeah. He's made. He's made. Everybody knew it. It was like Kailani. His quote is actually on the basketball Hollywood establishment shirt. Oh, that's sick. Yeah. That's sick. Yeah. We are willing to pay the price of our own stories. And he made a film that was about like people escaping the Derg and uh, going and moving somewhere else. And I thought that movie is dope, but like. It w you know, not a lot of people have seen it, but that's one of the only movies I've seen that is like, you know, there's so many movies about white people's history. Yeah. There's barely any scripted versions of ourselves doing it, and so when I saw that, it, it made me inspired, like, oh, I could tell my parents' story, you know? Because we all have similar kind of stories of people having to move because of whatever, you know? And, but, but yeah, I'll let someone else talk, but that's all I had to say. <laughs> yeah, so Haile Grima is an interesting person. Um, his approach that he took was interesting. It was very anti-Hollywood. Um, yeah. So do we think, moving forward, is being anti-Hollywood the appropriate approach? Um, should we work with Hollywood to tell our stories? Should we tell it on our own? I know Dr. Mahirat was saying that you know we should take initiative and uh, tell our own stories, but what do you guys think? Um, two things, I think one, he had to be anti-Hollywood um, in order to stay as true and as you know authentic as he can. Um, and two, I think today we really have the power is really in our hands and the control is in our hands, right? So some people don't mind kind of having that Hollywood support. It might mean more to have you know major, like a, a wider, I guess, net um, to tell a story on the surface versus people who might care more about the message um, and are okay with like a more niche audience so that the control stays with them. I don't think there's a bad, there's nothing really bad about going the Hollywood route, I don't think. It just depends on the story you're trying to tell and how much control you're willing to kind of give up. Um, Cause at the end of the day, the Hollywood approach is the more money and like more money comes more rules. Um, so yeah, I think it just depends on the person creating, the person telling the story. Uh, but you can, you can be successful today and just having kind of the control in your hands, given all the different platforms that we kind of self-distribute. Um, it just might take a longer, longer t path to get more people's eyes on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I interviewed Gash Haile like about a year ago. Um, when he he was in LA for a while, he lives in DC, but he was in LA for a while because um, he works with Ava DuVernay and her production company, Array. They have their headquarters downtown. And so he was here doing a master class with like artists across disciplines, not just filmmakers. Um, and then at the same time, they were um, like re releasing Sankofa, which is like his film that he's most well known for, um, onto Netflix, which was like huge and weird kind of for his legacy because like. His whole thing was like he was an LA Rebellion filmmaker. There was all these black filmmakers that went to UCLA together um, that like could, they, like you said, had to be anti Hollywood. Nobody would distribute their films. Nobody wanted to look at them. Mm -hmm. um, and then now he has a f his like his film that's like such a big, huge part of his legacy that's on Netflix. And so we we were talking about that, and I asked him how it felt to reconcile um, his whole thing being anti Hollywood with like. I guess seeing himself beginning to be embraced by the industry in a way. At the same time, he was uh, he was being honored at the Academy Museum when it was like being opening um, opening for the first time as their like the vanguard. It was like some award that they're starting that's going to be like awarded to a major filmmaker every year, and he was their inaugural one. So it was this weird moment where like decades after he got his start and made his name, um, parts of Hollywood are starting to pay attention to him. And so I asked him how that felt and how that fits into his ideology. And he was like, Salome, I don't know Hollywood. I don't know Netflix. I know Ava. Um, and it was really interesting. He went, to talk, um, to t went on to talk more about how exactly what you're saying about how like you can pick your approach. You can go the Hollywood route. You can go elsewhere. I think it's going to take a lot of people doing different things and choosing to work together when it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, being a, like, a studio filmmaker um, is never going to make sense for him. Like I, I was asking him kind of about the Netflix deal and how that got put together, and he was just not involved with it. He was like, I don't have a cell phone. I don't know Ava did that. <laughs> um, and he was like, I'm so happy. Yeah. He was like, I'm so happy people are watching the film, and like I trust her because I have a relationship with her. She made that happen, and that's cool. Um, but 
Hollywood can never embrace me. I, I should pull up, I don't want to butcher it, but he said something where he was like, Hollywood can never embrace me. I'm not a decoy. I'm not like going to be a face of Hollywood erasing everything that it's done to people like me for so long. Um, so I'm glad people are watching my movie now, but I go back to my cave. And he's like, he's working on this like five hour documentary he's making. About Which, Ottawa? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, can, just to add to that, we like, I used to work at uh, with the owners at Oslo Vegan, and we, I think some people here, I think I saw like Miriam and uh, Henok too, like we also did a fundraiser type of event to have people see the uncut, unedited version of this five hour documentary, which is now I would say probably 30 years in the making, yeah, or 20 years in the making, but it's more important, I think this is what he said, it's more important for him, um, to continue working on this and not giving himself a deadline because it's you can't really alter the accent or you can't really alter the emotions that as the maker you're you're seeing as you're cutting as you're in the editing room and cutting this film i literally think it's been i could be wrong but it's 25 years yeah or something like that in the making like it's almost like it's never going to be done but that's archival work like it's <laughs> It's, it, it was present one day, now 25 years later, that same thing he's working on is literally an archival piece of history, but also a film that you can watch today and embrace and see the rawness of it. And I think that's the biggest benefit of being anti-Hollywood is you don't need to follow any aesthetic uh, continuity or process that is deemed the right way. Because there's emotion in seeing something that's raw and edited very randomly, I would say, or you know, it's abruptly cut halfway, kind of get static or a black frame for two seconds and then it's, you know what I mean? It's just there's something that's like a real, real documentary. <laughs> it's, it's really as raw as it can get and who knows when it'll be done, but I think there's something beautiful in his patience and his process. So I actually, I asked him about that too. And I was like, what does it look like to work on a film for 30 years? Like, how, <laughs> how many hours a week are we putting into this? Like, um, and he told me that it's actually like basically done, but the reason that it's not like packaged and like available to see is because like he ripped stuff from Italian archives from like with that. Basically he was like, the Italians won't give me the rights right. um, to the things that I put in the movie. Couldn't get the and, samples cleared. Yeah, like, <laughs> He was like, next time you're in DC, come to my house and you can watch the movie. But <laughs> I was like, okay, gosh, I make. And the publicist was like, let's wrap this up. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, there's something really incredible about like that uncompromising vision. And like, we might never see that movie, unless, um, except for, I mean, okay, those of us who are lucky enough to end up in his house in DC to go see it. Um, but yeah, I don't think that. We can necessarily all be that way, but I think it takes some of us to be that way, and then it takes somebody like Ava, who kind of cut her teeth and took her time and like came up learning from folks like Kylie mm -hmm. and studying films like that, and then choosing to go a more traditional route to like help give us those special mm -hmm. moments where it's like now we can watch Uncle on Netflix and talk about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to tack on something that, uh, that came up for me while, while both of you were speaking. Um, so for Hadi Garima, I'm also very intrigued by him, even as a designer, because I, I was looking at one of his interviews and he had said something that stuck out to me about leaving behind cultural pyramids um, for, you know, up and coming, for black people in general, like we don't have cultural pyramids, right? So like white people, they have Warner Brothers, they have these like huge like uh, engines behind them, basically. And so to the comment that you just made about like, oh, if we're lucky enough to know Gashe Haile, but like, what going off of what uh, Maharat was saying and what we've all kind of been circling around of this like horizontal power structure, my dream is that we can actually put together events where we can have screenings of those private things and Haile Garima can, can come and, and talk about it and because we, we need to see that. Like all of us, like that's a cultural pyramid, even, even, even if it's not, a physical space, it's a, um, it's a psychological space, a creative space. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of, shoot, there's probably highly good emails in this, in this room, matter of fact, you know, like up and coming future ones. So that's just my comment. And then obviously if the audience, if you guys want to chime in, yes, Anna. Uh, yeah, I was shouted out with both side I wanted to jump in. He is a, a family friend, actually, had a couple sides, and it's funny because his his son Marawi went the Netflix route kind of first mm -hmm. before he was in that weird position that, that just 
position that you were talking about, but to talk about a funny uh, scene from the screening that we watched a few years ago, um, I and I didn't know this about his father until he told me. You know, uh, his name is Haile, right? It's funny when we call Ethiopians by their last names in Ethiopia. You call people by their first name. So the Garima in the Haile Garima was his dad, and he was an Ethiopian Orthodox priest, but he was also a fighter against the Italian fascists during the time of the monarchy. And then he became one of the like foremost playwrights. And the, all that, like those three different like facets of him in so many different ways of his life were in the movie on, on World War II that he's been making forever. So um, I think, you know, Dee took my first question actually, which was what you guys are all talking about. But it, I think it shows like the functionality, like whether you want to go the independent route or whether you want to go, uh, you know, mainstream or whatever we want to call it, you know, the corporate route. Uh, you know, do you and then, you know, if those personal connections are there and some of us are independent and some of us are there, as long as we trust each other, we can make the best of uh, both worlds. And if I could ask a, a question, actually, it's funny, I think some people have a, kind of a inevitability view of history. And so there's some songs by like Teddy Afro and stuff about the monarchy, the Solomonic dynasty. But I think it hasn't been painted in as positive a light over the past 50 years. And um, the, the folks behind Grandpa was an emperor, uh, which was screened on Crenshaw King and Lamert, talking about connecting to our uh, black American spaces in South LA. I was at the LA screening. I don't know if anyone else here was. Um, I think that was a step in the direction. I was wondering if Prince Yoel could talk about maybe the mixed feelings, and maybe even different panelists may have that, but the mixed feelings about kind of the the legacy of the Solomonic dynasty and if anyone who knows my uh, minor YouTube channel would say it, uh, it's prospects for return. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, Grandpa is an emperor is a fantastic documentary. I encourage everybody to go watch it if you can. Um, and um, that's my cousin Yeshi actually and I'm, I'm really excited about her doing that. Um, because it's time to tell our stories. And uh, I think for us, especially in the royal family, we feel a special responsibility to carry the legacy and at least let the story be told because I totally agree with what you're saying. And I experienced that, for instance, when we got married and it was all over social media. You know, a lot of the comments were great and then some comments were, you know, you know glad we don't have the monarchy anymore. Although the ones that really surprised me the most were those who said, oh, we had a monarchy, we had a king, when? <laughs> this is Ethiopians in the comments saying that. Those were the ones that hurt me the most. I, you know, I understand people love it or hate it, but people just didn't know. That made me also realize how much of our history we're losing. And, and like you said, obviously it's, it was intentional by previous regimes who wanted to kind of uh, you know, delete that history that didn't happen and start kind of Ethiopia as a brand new country, which is to me very ironic given that we're such an old country with so, so much history that we would act like we just started 50 years ago. Uh, it's really paining me that um, that was the, you know, the, the, the design that some people did. Now, I do agree with you. I think Teddy Afro and others have kind of brought it back into the mainstream, but it is true that I've noticed a kind of glaring missing part of our history, which I think we can address in a truthful way, in a you know open-minded way. Obviously, not everything was great, but we had a lot of great history, and you know, um, I just think that it's really a shame that we would deprive ourselves of such a long legacy in our country. Now, obviously, people can feel how they feel about it, but I don't accept that people will act like it never happened. Um, you know, we're on a different course now, Ethiopia, right? The prospects for the return of the monarchy, I can't tell you the, the, the polling right now. I don't know what's, what's the status there. I do know that people talk about it a lot, but um, all I'm hoping is that at least by telling the stories, people can examine them, uh, we can debate them, um, but they are essentially a part of who we are, and we can't deny that. Denying that is de denying our own story. Uh, just to go off of uh, um, Yoel, um, I think that uh, his point about like let's actually get the work out and let it be examined is such an important point because um, that's how we grow and heal, right? Mm -hmm. We can talk about these things and we can grow and heal and then more people can make 
work about that and maybe it'll be from a different perspective but now we actually have a foundation right so I think that's like like a very very important point yeah, I agree. And just to continue on that, we can't heal until we address it. And, and I totally agree. I think that that has been the problem of all the successive regimes we've had. You know, the, the communist coup happened, toppled the monarchy, and then they were like, yeah, forget the monarchy. Don't talk about it. It was the worst thing ever. And then, uh, you know, the Federal Republic is established, and they're like, yeah, the Derg, and everybody before that, they were terrible. Everybody's terrible. And then now, same thing, right? In a way, I don't mean I don't want to get political, but you, you know what I'm talking about. That there's just that this this desire to kind of completely vanquish whoever came before, and that's very unhealthy for our people because it's discontinuous. You have to be connected to your history, whether you like it or not. It's part of who you are, and I totally agree that until we do that, that we have like a sort of truth and reconciliation. That um, that's something I've seen a lot ever since the war came out. Is all of these narratives on social media about this people did this to that people and they were oppressed and this and it's like this is yeah let's talk about it you know maybe there's some true grievances there but there's also a lot of misinformation things that have just been made up on the way and until we get to the truth we can't really move forward in a positive way I think also um, I don't know how to say this but I think okay a few years ago my friends and I were as it was around the same time we screened uh, the documentary um, we were kind of questioning, like, why don't we have any of these things in writing or in film or in the arts or in any medium? And I don't remember who said this, but I think they said something along the lines of, well, there's a lot of trauma that our parents have held back from us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it kind of paints this picture of, okay, we know our parents immigrated here. We don't know for what reason. Maybe some of us do, some of us didn't. Um, or we find out later that our uncle is a poet or our, our other uncle is a writer and is, had a passion for filmmaking and just wasn't able to do it because of historical events. And it made us kind of come to this conclusion where it's like, in order to get to a place where you can tell these stories, I, there has to be some healing. There has to be something like therapy, something for the historians who are still here to be able to kind of open up and tell these stories from perspective of truth. And let them breathe. And let them breathe and don't feel so pressured to like create something, create something, create something. I know we all want this. And maybe maybe you have a source that is ready to, to kind of open up and, and give that type of information out. But I think there's a lot of healing that needs to happen um, in the generations before us. And then conversations uh, on their time. And I think once you can record it, you can audio record it, you, you, with permission, of course, and um, you can write about it, but I think it's, I think there needs to be healing, there needs to be conversations, um, and time. I don't know, I don't, I don't know. I think it's something that it's gonna be very, if we start now, or maybe it's been happening, or I don't know, but I think unless we're telling stories from our perspective, once we get into, and this is just my opinion, once we get down this like historical, retelling of something, there's gonna have to be a lot of perspectives involved. Definitely. And I think it needs to start with healing. I don't know. It should be a, it should be a mosaic, you know? Yeah. Um. There's uh, this book that, it's fiction, but it's based on truth, Under the Lion's Gaze, you know about this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I got a movie deal, and it's all about um, a doctor escaping from the derg, mm -hmm. why they're leaving, uh, a story of three women, but it's like, I, I don't know if it'll get made, but it's like there are people trying to do it, and and I think, you know, we're, I think we're kind of in the infancy of being able to do that. So, over time, we'll start to have like, what's our version of, uh, like Saving Private Ryan, you know, or whatever the <laughs> fuck, you know, we gotta have, you know, and even like, uh, I don't know if you guys saw this, like Ozzy Testify. She, she's having, she's got a show in development with Coogler's company called Queen of Sheba, which is obviously like way earlier than the period we're talking about, but that's the start. It's like, she, yeah, she described it to me as it'll be like Ethiopian Game of Thrones or Habesha Game of Thrones, you know? And I'm like, that's, that's sick. Let's yeah. fucking, let's see that, because that's real. Mm -hmm. That was real. But you wouldn't know that based on, you know, what, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I just want to say one more thing. Um, oh, I'm sorry. When you're talking about doing um, history and reporting on that in, in a film setting, within, because I, 
I found this in attempting to even try and understand the history of our people and stuff like that. Every version of stories were linked with propaganda, and depending on whose story, whose pen you're reading, is skewing the reality of what the story is. And how does one so in like a lot of material has been lost, right? And human memory is feeble, and it's you can only remember what you saw and time changes a lot of stuff too. So how can you really be accurate about a story and represent the truth of that one? And because whatever version you do, it's going to be skewed in one direction or another. And so one side of the people will feel hard done by it. Or is, is a potential positive way to do it? So that's the question. From my, my, the reason I'm asking this is like, I saw a woman came, I was gassed, and then I heard the story, I was out of bed. <laughs> Um, however, my, the only reason I thought it was problematic was not how they reimagined the narrative, because I think there's a philosopher that once said, whatever your belief system, it's your belief system. If living by your belief system doesn't give you a happy, fulfilled life, change the belief system, because if that's not, in, that's not you know, science, it's just talk, right? So with that being said, Woman King could have potentially been positive thing in terms of reimagining the story if, they, if it was presented as look what we could have been if we came together and if that was a clear open agenda that they were honest about you know what I mean but presenting something as factual and it is a is problematic right and so as we are embarking on telling important stories from Haile Selassie everything the Haile stories and everything that is rooted in like a lot of controversy depending on whose version of reality you speak to. How do you how do you navigate that and how are you intending on doing that? Is it the utopic way that, that like as a suggestive or is it like really trying to tell history, in which case how are you gonna be able to really tell a true history with the current climate in the way that it is? I'm just going to, I'm going to jump and then obviously you guys can uh, jump on it. I just want to say like, as a creative, like, no, I'm not a filmmaker, um, but as a creative and a designer, I think it's best for us to not get into analysis paralysis. I think that you just got to go and throw mud at the wall and hopefully like whatever is put out is like, you know, a reaction is not a bad thing. I'm not mad. Like I make stuff and some people don't like it and that's good. Like, I, a matter of fact, I like it when people don't like my work because it, it actually ignites them to go make something that they feel is more uh, uh, representative or true to them. And like, either way, it's good because now, now we have more voices, now we have more stories. So if he makes something that you don't like, go make a better, ver go, sh go show us your, your side of it. Because we're still trying to have that conversation. I mean, like, that's my approach. You know, I'm, I'm bringing like a little bit of PA to the situation, but I'm just saying like, I think it's good to have I think it's good to disagree. I think it's good to agree, and I think it's good to disagree, and I think it's good to create like a, um, I was talking to somebody else, and I'm gonna borrow their words, but like a, like a rainbow, you know what I mean? You, you need all the colors to have the, the variation, and so we need all the stories to have variation in perspective, and variation in lessons, and variation in, because every message has a lesson, you know what I mean? So, um, but Binyam had said something that I wanted to comment on too, he said, uh, um, man, what did you say, man? You said a lot. Uh, was uh, not the Habisha Game of Thrones. There was, uh, you said, who's the next Habisha Insecure? And then it was something else. Oh. Saving Private Ryan. Uh, Saving Private Ryan. Uh, oh, I felt dirty for a long time because I wanted to see a show about the Dirk. Because I heard about the, the these crazy stories from relatives, from... I, I uh, just when I was young, I love to talk to my old heads. I love to ask them things. I love to get into it, and they've always opened up to me and been raw. And I was, I, I always wanted to see because this is what he said. He said, "There's so many different takes on World War II. I have seen so much content on wor World War II. I don't need to see any more. I can visualize it up and down, side to side, diagonally. I feel like I was there. If I could time travel, I know, I know exactly what I'd be wearing. Like the, that's how good the creative direction, everything. We've seen every angle of it. But I don't know anything about the Dirk." Only the museum that I went to, and only what I've heard from my old heads. And like, I'm 30, bro. Like, I, I was born 92, dog. Like, that, it wasn't really that long ago. But like, come on, man, it's 2023. Why don't we have more stories about the dirt? Healing and time. 
I know, I know. I'm just, I'm just hyped. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't agree with you more because I bet if you talk to all these different European or whatever American filmmakers about different World War II movies, they would probably be like, that's inaccurate, that one's good, that one's wrong, and that's fine. It's like, we so hard on ourselves? exactly, be, I think because you know, you, you feel like you're first, you have to be correct perfect. or perfect, yeah, but it's like, you should try to do your best or whatever, but people, no matter what, are gonna disagree right. and be like, that's not right, and then, yeah, but that's, 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 art. that's cool, and even like people, Quentin Tarantino makes movies that are like alternate history. <laughs> He doesn't give a fuck about the facts. He's just like feelings. <laughs> feelings first. So, fuck it. Like. What was that movie he made with? Uh, it's literally World War II. Yeah. Um, the. the Master. Master. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He just changed history. He was like, yeah, we we killed Hitler. So yeah, make the movie. Make the movie where you killed Mengistu in it. Like, who cares? Yeah, who cares? You know. <laughs> but the question wasn't like or dislike. So I guess it's more to you, right? You always just like. <laughs> I think I got your question. Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, I think your question was um, how do you make sure you portray things accurately? And I'll go even further, perhaps because I am have family involved in the stories that I'm trying to tell, maybe there could be some bias there. Is that what you're saying? To portray it in a sort of nostalgic, positive yeah, way? Yeah, Must be a great film because we got a discussion happening, you know? Like, it's good. That's the point, though. Uh, I think to her question, though, is what is your guys' approach on the discernment going to right. be in regards to that topic? Well, I think that's the beauty about film, TV, any type of creative work is that you are there telling a story, your version of it. Now, I agree that you should try to be as accurate, especially when you're portraying history, but the truth is even historical um, elements are always subjective, right? You know the, the expression, uh, you know, the, the, um, the winners tell the, the, the get to tell the story? It's kind of like that. It's like you're doing the story, I get to tell the story, and then just like now said in, in BM, I couldn't agree more. It's the marketplace of ideas. You put out your story, and let's see, you know, which let the best idea win. And um, I inevitably, when you're doing, especially a, a creative process like a film, you're gonna have people involved anyway. So it's not like a book when you're in a book writer, you can write it all by yourself. When you're making a film, TV, there's going to be so many people. So I think what the approach I take is that always stay open-minded and listen to what others' perspectives are so that your story can get as many perspectives as possible. But the end product is always going to be have a take. And that's what we're here to do as creators is to say, hey, this is my version of the story. You can ask you know, each people who attended this evening tonight, how did it go? They'll tell you a different version, right? All of them are true to them, but anyway, my point is I, I agree with you that I think it's important, especially when you're trying to portray history as accurately as possible, but inevitably there's be some sub subjectivity to it, 
And with the woman king, I don't know why the, the whole hoopla was about, because I do think, I know that one of the criticism was that, oh, this is a tribe that was engaged in slavery. I don't think the movie didn't, the, the, the movie didn't hide that. They, and then they addressed it at the end when they're like, you know, we're doing the slavery thing, it's not good, we should change. So I thought it was addressed and I agree that I think it can hurt our own movies when we start to kind of scrutinize and try to, you know, bring down a, a very noble effort of, of portraying an African tribe which has been, uh, you know, these legendary fighters and their women on top of that. So the, purpose, the, the reasoning was problematic. Again, mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely um, starting to put together a team of, from you know academics who are experts, uh, people who have lived through that period, people who have uh, actual firsthand knowledge. You know, half of my family was imprisoned uh, during the Dirk, so I'm getting a lot of these kind of firsthand accounts too from them. And then the idea is also to surround yourself with people who can give interesting perspectives, and that's actually sometimes people who are not from your culture. I know that we just talked about. Uh, Abisha versus not Abisha, or Africans versus not Africans who are telling stories. And as much as I know we're in an era of authenticity, and I think that it should be driven from the people of the culture. Uh, oh, but I did want to comment, by the way, on that, uh, Habesha versus not Abisha, uh, echoing a little bit of what Meret was saying. Right now, in this current state, we don't have the luxury uh, of, of excluding each other. If an Ethiopian from Texas wants to tell a story about some, uh, something going on in Ethiopia, let's get together. You know, obviously partner with people who know what we're talking about, but in an ideal state, we will be able to do those kind of exclusions, but right now we need to come together because they're, they're strength in numbers. Um, and my point about the stories, I think, just to give you kind of like my final thought on this, is I think the ideal state for any story is just like World War II. That there's like a hundred stories and you can watch all of them and through them you can kind of get to the truth. Maybe this one has a little bit of, you know, this part. This one talks about this, what happened in this country. By the time you've seen all of it, that's when you're in a better place. It's like, and, and that's what I invite. I would love nothing more than, you know, coming out with these stories from Ethiopian history and then having others do it and then you do it. And then, you know, by the time you have this whole canvas, you can see a clear picture and get to the truth like that. Okay, so carrying on um, with our topic of carrying the torch, uh, how do we carry on the essence of traditional Ethiopian storytelling over uh, storytelling that continues negative perceptions of Africans perpetuated by Western media? We need a manifesto. Um, I think we need to, I don't know, it could be your own personal manifesto, but I think even as a community of, of creators or storytellers, because it's not just film, there's music, you know, there's different design. art, there's books, there's design. Um, but I think we need to really sit and think about what are the pillars that we're trying to hit um, and when it comes to storytelling, what's gonna make the Ethiopian in their train narratives 
I don't know. There's, I just think we need some sort of guidance because we don't have an infrastructure in filmmaking like the West does. Not saying we need it, but we should have some sort of manifesto or guidelines so that we hold ourselves accountable to the truth and to honesty, um, respect as well, uh, and also just being open-minded. I don't know. The list can go on, but I think that's a good start. Um, and it just kind of gives us something to look to kind of achieve. It, it, it may even give you constraints, and I always think constraints are the best way of really challenging your creativity. Um, but if it's not written out and laid out and followed and shared amongst the community, then we might kind of fall in the same trap of telling inaccurate stories or not taking into consideration another perspective. I know a lot of Ethiopia <laughs> things, whether it's a YouTube channel, a YouTube uh, commentary, whatever it may be, is very one-sided. One so I think we need to hold ourselves accountable. And I say we have to start with the manifesto. Yeah, I think, I think that's great. Um, I also think just by us getting more and more ingrained in these systems, we then have more power. Like you working for Beyonce and then I work for whatever, these different TV writers and whatever. We just have these connects. Because if you look at the things that are made by Hollywood um, that are set in the country, it's not from our, has anyone seen that movie Red Sea Divers or heard about it? Yeah, it's like they cast the dude from I Am the Captain now as a Habesha. And it's like, you couldn't find anyone, you know, because they don't, it's their perspective, which is fine, you know, because they don't care. So it's like, it's a story from the perspective of people who want to tell the narrative of they needed to escape and come to Israel so they could be safe. And I mean, it the movie speaks for itself. And it's because it's not made by people who, care about telling our narrative, but the more that we get ingrained in these systems, I have, like just from me writing for shows, now I know producers that are like, tell, I wanna tell the story of uh, a dude who goes back to Ethiopia after he fails in America and he's trying to make it in entertainment there. And they found, like, but they've never heard anyone pitch that to them. And they never knew anyone like me because we didn't know we could do this. So it's literally just us being in these positions, I think will lead to, those things happening. We just, it just hasn't happened because we're, we're the first class, yeah. you know? I also think that, like, as we talk about developing a canon of, like, Abisha film or films from our perspectives as a community, like, I like what you're saying about how, like, we need to build an infrastructure. It doesn't need to be what the West has. It doesn't need to be Hollywood. Because I also think that, like, there's danger in setting up criteria for what we are looking for from our community in a way that aligns just like the West. Because like, okay, so we keep talking about like World War II as this analogy of like this piece of history that we just can't stop talking about, which is like probably a good thing to a degree. Um, but something that I've talked um, about with a lot of my Jewish friends is that like they feel a frustration that they're like, this is the only piece of Jewish history that anybody knows about that isn't Jewish. Like there's so much else that like, so all of us who have no ties to like a very specific story about World War II have so much knowledge about it. Um, and they feel that they have this, this wealth and this depth of other stories to tell. Um, and I think that even though we're not in the same position, there's no, we don't have a canon of films about the Doug or the monarchy yet. And I think that we deserve that and could benefit from that. But I also think that we can't just look at like the canon of World War II films and be like, we need that and we need to tell Ethiopian stories and that means only talking about our wars. Like, there's this beautiful film that played at Sundance um, 2021, I think, um, from this filmmaker, Jessica Bashir, um, called Feyade. Um, and it, she made it over the course of t 10 or so years, um, going back to the village that like her, I don't think she grew up there, I think one of her parents grew up there, um, like went, she was visiting over a course of like 10 years, would go every year, every other year. Um, it kind of started with her just trying to like document stuff um, as her grandmother was passing away and she just wanted to have memories to hold on to. It wasn't meant to be a film. And then as she started to build a community there um, and like learned what, um, what the, the commerce of that community was set up like, she started learning about this plant called chat that is like a stimulant that's native to Ethiopia that I'm sure um, a lot of you are familiar with. Um, but 
it was really interesting. She made this film that kind of spanned centuries, um, going back into the history of like Sufi Muslims in the highlands of Ethiopia who like had these spiritual spiritual traditions around. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, and then followed that the trajectory. It used that as a through line to then talk about because um, it's like it's like the number one export of Ethiopia. Even though it's like it's not in Addis, it's not in like the cities of Ethiopia that people outside of Ethiopia think about. Um, but the highlands are so dependent upon it that it's Ethiopia's number one export. Um, so she told this really intense and intricate story that was so specific um, of all kinds of different Ethiopian stories that I had no idea about because they're not the Ethiopian cultures that my parents are from. Um, and I think that like there's so much that we're not even looking for. Like we don't even know what to look for yet. I think there's so much strength and specificity and we can't just look for um, the one thing. Like yes, I want a million different stories and takes on the monarchy and why all of our parents came to America. Um, but I want so much more that I haven't even thought to ask for yet. Can I add one thing? I have a question. Because that, what you just said, touches on exactly what I was going to ask is my question, I'm getting young, by the way. Um, <laughs> my uh, question is culture and history. I think culture, a lot of us, when we think of it, we think of it as history. That's the first thing that comes to us. And you, know, we, and you also ask about carrying the torch. The first stories that we learned, that I learned, is like my dad telling me how he got from Tigray or whatever to Addis, and that's that's the story. That's the base of where we get, you know, who we're from. And so my first question is, if there's anybody in, in your family, uncle, aunt, dad, whatever, who planted story, and if you remember what that, you know, feels like. Um, and as a creative, the one thing that I'm kind of struggling with and trying to grow more into is translating what that is into what we translate as culture, identity, whatever, whatever we're doing now. And so for you, what do you, if you have any thoughts on what culture means now, because I feel like culture changes, it's not just history with everything that happens, culture does move, and so what is your relationship with the culture now? Because I think a lot of what people are saying American versus Habesha from Ethiopia, whatever, that's like that hesitance, I feel like is not maybe knowing the history or being afraid to misrepresent the history or whatever, but as a contemporary Ethiopian Americans, how do you relate to the audience? How do you relate to those stories that your parents told you and you're trying to reinterpret them into something new? What is that challenge and how do you kind of you know, approach that? I mean, the stories that my dad would tell me about, like, you know, he lived in horror, and then he had to, like, go to school in Aspatafuri. That was, like, you know, when he was, like, seven, eight years old by himself, just so he could continue schooling. And, I like, these stories to me are timeless and also um, the, relatable to people that aren't Ethiopian, too. Like, that, like, if I can watch, I don't know, like... Uh, I don't know if you've seen like RRR, this Indian movie that came out. If I could watch that and be like, this is a great, like why couldn't people watch that and feel as though it's just timeless to them? So I guess it is, it is I, I don't really think about trying to make it be cultural in that it's like, how do I please the Ethiopians? But more like, how do I make this a good story with the, the elements that will make it entertaining? You know, and, and just through making it specific by knowing the details, hopefully that also makes it cultural, you know? I don't know if that answers Is the, the question. Audience a big aspect of I find whenever I've been making something and I'm thinking too much about the audience, it makes the thing bad. So I I I feel like then you're like, oh well they like this, I should take this and you're just you're not thinking about the actual narrative itself. You're not thinking about the characters, you're thinking about some reaction that doesn't even exist yet because your thing's not even out in the world. And so obviously you have to be cognizant of it, but I wouldn't lead with that, you know? I uh, actually wanted to interject because earlier, was that question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to jump in. Um, earlier, uh, sometimes I like to refer to myself as like a watered down version of Binium because some of the things <laughs> that he's fairly accomplished in comedy or writing or um, Things, things of that nature, those are the things that I like to aspire to. So like earlier with what you're talking about with breaking the status quo, like that's 
that's how I think that it's done normally and like really, really efficiently as well, where somebody that looks very similar to you does the thing that you wanted to accomplish and then now it's way more attainable to you than ever before, right? Uh, I just want to touch on a, a brief story where there was like a runner and then there's like, a, uh, I think it's like a two hour marathon or something like this and nobody thought that you could do a sub two hour marathon, mm -hmm. right? And then one time, this one runner breaks that, that marathon and then now the next time they had that same marathon, there was like 30 more people that were able to do it sub third, uh, that two hours, meaning that they were able to see one person accomplish it now that inspires in them the idea that they could accomplish it as well. So that being said, my question to the panel is, um, how do you accomplish those feats without already having somebody to kind of refer to uh, or somebody to see in that position as well? So you haven't seen that um, representation per, per se, and now you're having to kind of pioneer that journey, right? And so, how do you guys kind of uh, approach that? That's my question. I think I would be lying if I said I didn't see someone in that position, or in, or at least in the industry. Mm -hmm. It may ha not have been a lot of people, but I think I was like 13 when I, it was <laughs> so funny, it was on MySpace. I was on Carrie Hilson's MySpace, <laughs> and on her top eight was someone named Ethiopia like on her top eight. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, who does Carrie Hilson know that's Ethiopian and her name is Ethiopia? I was just like very intrigued by it. <laughs> and I just remember doing a whole bunch of research and finding out she works at a music label. I've always wanted to work in music. Uh, I didn't know it would end up in like the music, on the production side of music or the creative direction side of like an, an artist's work. But that was probably the first Ethiopian I've seen um, in an industry that's that I had interest in. So, Again, one person, but I knew if she was able to do it, that maybe there's a, a there's hope. Mm -hmm. um, takes a lot of risk, but I think now that I'm in it, or now that we're all in it, I do see a lot more Abishas, and I think it's great. I think it's something that younger generations can look forward to. Um, but I I think there's I don't know. I've always had someone to look towards as a goal or as like an accomplishment factor. Yeah, I feel like you take what you can get, like, as far as representation and mentorship. Um, there are a few, like, Abisha journalists who I definitely look up to. There's this um, woman, Hanna Georgis, at The Atlantic, who I've been reading since I was in, like, high school, um, since before I realized um, that this is what I wanted to do. She was just somebody that I read, um, and that was really valuable, just kind of seeing that name um, in, in stuff that I realized that I wanted to do. But I think also... Um, Yoel, I think you were saying something about like we don't have the luxury to exclude each other. Um, I think that like mm -hmm. I I don't limit my role models to just being Abisha because if I did, I would never get anything done. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like and like I mean I don't know maybe that's sad, but like it's also just kind of like where we're at like as a culture, especially all of us are working in American industries. Mm -hmm. As a culture, there hasn't been a like an, a history of Abishas being in America as long as there have been a lot of other places, people from other countries. Um, and so I feel like I looked up a lot to, like, okay, um, uh, I mean, this show really fell off and we don't have to talk about all everything attached to it, but like Master of None was really big for me when that came, the first season, <laughs> when, it, when it first came out. Um, because it was like, oh, this is a show that's like, it's a cool, like edgy, prestige streaming comedy about a first generation story that I really relate to. It was about Indians. It's not a culture that I'm from, but a lot of it made sense to me. It was very legible to me. Um, and I think that like, and I look back at like who I grew up with, all of my friends at school that were at Abisha, like all of them were first gen. I didn't realize it when I was like five making friends, but it was like, I found myself gravitating to first gen people. So I think you just like, you find the people that you can identify with um, beyond just those lines of being Ethiopian, being Eritrean, being African. Um, you just kind of, you take what you can get and put yourself there when you can get there. I mean, like I would love for our kids to be able to have an Abisha in every industry to look, look up to and model their paths after, but I don't think you can wait for that. Yeah, um, absolutely agree with both, both of you. Uh, you know, hopefully you find someone who's a mentor who's Abisha, and that's great. But if not, the next best thing is maybe something that 
uh, you share in common with that person. Maybe it's a young black man doing, you know, what you're doing in the industry, uh, or um, someone who went to your school, or someone who has your background. Oh, I started in this industry and now I'm made into film. They can be your mentor and your kind of role. Um, you know, I know that, for instance, what we're doing specifically as a like Ethiopian producer, there are people like Meret who I got very much inspired by. Uh, she's a close family friend too, so um, you know, look up to her what she's doing and her husband who was a lawyer turned filmmaker. So I feel very you know inspired by that too. Uh, but I know in law school, for instance, a lot of us who were thinking about getting into entertainment. We look up to like people like Charles King, you know, or some even actors who are um, from Howard. Uh, so you can always find a, a point in common, uh, especially in the entertainment industry, since I think we're just kind of arriving and, and, and kind of in numbers now. And, and this is what's so great about uh, an organization like Hollywood is Habesha, is that we can start to network and see that, oh, actually, there's, there's plenty of others who are doing what, what I'm doing. And, you know, we can stick together. So if you don't find the exact person who's like an older version of you, just find the next best thing and, and some point of common with that person. Yeah, just to add to that, I'll say like, it's, it's important to realize how you're being perceived from the outside because when I get hired on these shows, they're not hiring me as an Ethiopian American. They're hiring me as diverse man, black man, you know? <laughs> so I'm, bla I'm just black to these white people. And so, and I am, I mean, I am black. But it's like, it, they, they're not thinking of it as specific as, as we are. So I was always inspired by Donald Glover, Aziz, fucking... Uh, yeah, the, the, the kid, Bobby kid, Davidson. nah, but <laughs> kid Cuddy. It was more about like, what are you doing on a soul level that connects with my soul? Like, oh, do I relate to what you're doing more so than like, oh, are you from the exact same country? Because I was like, I know that, you know, to the cops, we all look the same or whatever. That kind of thing. It's like they're they're not drawing these distinctions. So I may, why am I gonna separate myself from these people who look just like me? You know, I will say though, um, back to when again when I saw that there were there was this Ethiopian woman named Ethiopia in the music industry. Um, the one thing that it did for me though was I was able to show my mom and my parents yeah. who were like not really understanding yeah. what it was that I want to do, and I'm like, but look, like <laughs> there's an Ethiopian a girl who works in music, so yeah. I could do it. I don't have to be a doctor. I don't have to. And of course it was like, nah, like what do you? They didn't understand it. So if I didn't, I think for me, it wasn't more so about like seeing someone in the industry that I want to, now I know I can do it. It was more about like, can I really do it? Yeah. I know there's a way, but if I don't have the support from my fam, or am I that different? Like, I don't know. I really do think there was a little bit of doubt. Although I was always like willing to try and do whatever, um, there was still that I'm the oldest in the family. Like, am I really about to take this risk? And uh -huh. Does it make sense? Am I just naive? I don't know. Sometimes as a first generation, you kind of sometimes feel like an immigrant because yeah, like, I don't yeah. know, you may think you're, you're a little so different because at home you were raised differently than your friends who were born here too. I don't know. So I think seeing you know, just that one Ethiopian that was a woman who also works in the industry, somehow she convinced her parents. So I'm going to continue to try and convince my parents <laughs> that this is what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Um, I mean, same with the weekend, right? I showed yeah. my parents him, and they were like, "What the hell is he talking about?" But I was like, <laughs> "But look, he it's did. on, it's on MTV <laughs> though." So. <laughs> Super Bowl. Okay. Uh, last question. We got to wrap up soon, so make you the last Thank one. Thank you for allowing me to be the last. Um, my name is Kellen Murphy Oliver Coleman, and I was closing. I know the majority of you guys up here on stage, and my question is a little different than the questions that have been asked previously. But I'm a part of a nonprofit organization called the Jared uh, Makona Masana Project. So what we are doing in this time is we're working to build a library about an hour outside of Agnes in a really desolate area. Kids got to walk miles and miles to get to a really rough school, and within the next year we're building twenty. So my question is, is how do I, as an Ethiopian living in America, reach out and connect with the diaspora to, you know? get donations, to reach out to people that want to get dirty and get on the ground and work with us over in Ethiopia and help build the library and the clinic and things like that. Like, how do I leverage my connections and the people that I know like you guys to make those dreams come true? 
I don't really hear a lot about these things. I wish I knew more about these type of projects. And I think all of, well, I shouldn't speak for everyone, um, but I'm always looking forward to the day that I can go back and do something. Um, and more from a creative or artful approach, just because that's what I know, I guess. Um, but I think just tapping in and asking like this, at least for me, it just made me interested, so. Yeah, I think it's just as simple as asking sometimes. But, um, you know, that's something that I've been mindful as well. I'm not really hip to a lot of these organizations, but, um, you know, running 2591 worldwide um, and something that would announce soon, um, you know, using some of the proceeds of that to give back into the community um, is something that I want to do. So, you know, just bringing it to people's attention and, you know, we can create initiatives and find ways in to incorporate it in what we do. And then I'll just add this. I think it's really important to attach any any kind of work that you're trying to do, especially like community work, um, to your uh, wheelhouse, right? So like, one thing you didn't mention is that you're also an actress, you're also a model, and you've also gotten a lot of big jobs, and you have quite a following on Instagram. And I think that like connecting those dots and making sure that people know that that's a part of your work and what you do, and um, like like what Dinkinish said, like connecting two five nine one to community work or like, you know, Dinkinish and I run our own things, like, you know, obviously, not obviously, some of you guys know my work as, uh, as a designer with uh, St. Yard, some of you don't, um, but a lot, St. Yard is connected to Hollywood as Habisha, right? So I just think that like making sure that you're connecting all of those things, so when people find you or people know you in these places, they can also say, hey, I can go support this or things like that, because I think all of us, like um, everybody in this room knows somebody or has family back home that needs help. And a lot of our motivation, um, I mean, I don't want to assume and speak for everybody, but a lot of my motivation, and I know your motivation on a lot of people up here, are um, want to go back and help out, like just what Leah said, like, and figuring out how to connect that to your wheelhouse, where like, I, I can't necessarily get dirty right now and like, dig up a bunch of things, but I can design a lot of things. I can do a lot of graphic yeah, design. All right, so now I got a job. <laughs> You're doing it for free. <laughs> 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 for real though. Absolutely. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up. Um, we're gonna go to the last topic of distribution and funding. We're just gonna ask one question and make it really, really quick. Um, so how can we make our own stories without relying on studios to put out our stories? I know we touched on it in many different ways, but just like a quick recap on that. So I'll start because I wanted to uh, also mention, I did actually get the good fortune to see um, the documentary of uh, Haile Grima, I've been visiting him in, in his cave, uh, and definitely got through about two and a half hours of, of a long <laughs> documentary. Uh, but I wanted to kind of uh, caveat, and this is my experience of talking to him, is that I don't think he was anti-Hollywood to begin with. I think he became like that after working with people here and understanding the frustrations of you know, needing the funding and needing the studio to come in and then them having a say, and their say is usually not um, someone who has the perspective of the live story will have a more authentic one and they want to revert to stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why he went the independent route. Um, and I respect that. I think it's, it's a matter of choice. Uh, but I was going to say that Hollywood is still the number one purveyor of image around the world. It's the number one place for storytelling that's going to be broadcast around the world. So I think that if you want to work outside of the Hollywood a stream, that's great. But you were talking about, for instance, Teza, which is a very important film about the Derg. But you said nobody saw it. Yeah. It was not there. Why? You're outside of the Hollywood uh, system? There, there, there's, there's some trade-offs. So I'm not saying pick one or the other. But definitely for me, I know that a big focus is to work through Hollywood because we, this is the platform to broadcast your story to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and they're the ones with the biggest funding to, to, to reach the kind of projects creatively and, and strategically that you want to do at that level. The independent route is, is, uh, is very, very um, I respect it a lot too, and it, and it just gives you more control. But then you might be missing out on getting it in front of as many people as you want. So I think you just have to find what works for you and go through the system that will work the best for you. Yeah, to add to that, I'd say uh, it's like the, the, the thing of like how do we do it outside of the Hollywood system is based on maybe some idea of lack, like they won't let us or something. But I think they will. They just don't know. <laughs> So, like, if you're lucky enough to work within the systems 
of like I'll just speak about me like writing for other people's shows and then getting to know these producers whatever people know you from things you've made or written they want to know well what do you want to do and if you pitch them something they've never heard and they're like wow like we could do that there that hasn't been done they get excited and they want to do it they just I, I think now is the time where it's and, and they're not doing it out of charity. You know, we're saying these things of like, what can we do to go back and help out? I think even changing that narrative is like, what can we do to go back and profit? We could pro like, like this shit is actually, it's, it's the most untapped market. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we don't even need to look at it as this like, they'll help us please. It's like, <laughs> they, they, want, they want it, you know? And that my path at least to, do, to, to get things out there is just using the connections I've made through the jobs I've had and uh, you know, p putting together the, the skills to make something seem alluring to people who have the money. But you know, if you don't wanna do that, you got YouTube, you got Vimeo. But often, the path from those things goes back towards studio. You wanna make a short film, you take it to a festival, what are you trying to get? Distribution. So that's Hollywood. So it's like, you could do that too, but it often ends up with trying to get Hollywood. Yeah. Okay, well thank you so much, all of you, on this incredible panel. I hope all of you took some incredible gems from this conversation. Um, we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, but yeah, so we have a few announcements actually, um, and then we're gonna let you break off and get to talk with people on the panel and get to meet each other. Um, and hopefully this results in some creative projects and some great things in the future, um, just off these relationships. So we're gonna go to the announcements. So uh, we talked a lot about distribution and um, creating stories ourselves and everything that you guys heard. So um, a solution provided by myself under 2591 Worldwide and what I need a lot of assistance with from everyone <laughs> is Kitful, which is um, a streaming platform for all original diaspora content. Um, it's called Kitsville, raw and good content. Um, we're not talking blockbuster productions or anything like that, but us using the resources that we have with people like us in the room and making productions together. Um, so that, that's that. Um, if you guys. <laughs> like I said, I can't do this alone. So um, we've had several people send in submissions of short films, but we definitely need a much larger Rolodex of you know, series, episodes, documentaries, short films, um, feature films, anything. So if any of you guys are creators and have anything in the works or anything completed, um, if you go to the website, kitsvo.tv, um, there's a place for submissions, um, and you guys can also join the wait list for when it launches and stay up to date on that. Um, second announcement is Iqub. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the concept. It's nothing new. Um, it's an indigenous practice, a mutual aid fund of uh, pulling together, basically, you know, um, getting members to join a group, and every month people um, contribute dues, and every month the, the money pool that's collected goes to a different person on a rotational basis. Um, and we're taking that same concept, but we're using it towards creatives. So every month we're funding a different creative project. So if you have a short film you wanna put out, an album you wanna put out, you wanna curate an art gallery or anything like that, um, it's gonna be a rotational fund, um, which will be a mobile app. Um, so if you guys go to the website, itgoob.io, you guys can join the wait list and wait for updates on that. And our last announcement, um, I will let Dagmawi um, and introduce this from the Habesha Film Association on their website launch, or I, I can do it. Okay, well it's basically the video that's showing you their website. Um, they, it's an opportunity for people to come together and network um, virtually. Um, they have rooms where you can discuss and meet other people. Um, you get to select what your role is, if you're a director or a cinematographer, and so on, um, and you get to meet and connect with other Habashas in the industry. So go to their website at hfa.media, create a profile, and meet others. And <laughs>